Well, my name is Tim Kearns. I think most of you have heard me speak a little bit already, and uh, I'm CIO at Gloss, based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, we are we call ourselves a nonprofit, but we're not officially registered in Canada yet. But we're we're working in that direction, and that's uh, that's our plan. Uh, to further, we've already got a number of Canadian partners, and we want to deepen those relationships and uh, and also open up the opportunity to increase Gloss's influence. Uh, exposure rated region. But today I'm just going to try to wrap up some of the stuff that we've heard over the last couple of days and where I think we're going to go. And this is not, these are not just my thoughts. These are in conjunction with Meredith, who's not in her chair, and at least who's not in his chair, and that's okay. Um, but we've had lots of people who have been involved with charting the future for late 2030. And uh, and it's it's exciting to report on. Um, I did want to, you know, in case you're not aware, I know that Mike Brissett and Mark Tusonic is keenly aware, but I don't actually live in the Great Lakes. I live in Victorian British Columbia. And um, so you're thinking, why is this guy even here? <laughs> anyway, but, you know, I, but I grew up in Sault Ste. Marie and I, I love the Great Lakes. I, Lifeguarded on Lake Superior and Lake Huron. I sailed in Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Uh, I swam in suntanned on Lake Michigan, probably too much suntanning. And, uh, you know, I, I think I've had experiences with every single lake and it, it's been phenomenal and it shaped my youth. And even in university, I scuba dived in the, in the great, uh, uh, sorry, in the Detroit River, like digging up sediment samples to understand how they'd interacted on how sediments were formed in a turbid environment. You know, it's pretty gross actually looking back on it. But um, no, that's, you know, that's that's all part of the story, right? And that's ultimately kind of why we're here. And that's, this is my story, right? And you don't really want to hear about my story. <laughs> but, but I'm interested and it probably would be valuable at some point. You're like, what's your story? You know, why are you here? Janice from Teledyne Geospatial, um, she said it yesterday, we're, we're all interested in this because we're passionate about it. And you can even, that really comes through in people's presentations, you know, they're super comfortable, they're confident, uh, they're knowledgeable about their topic, and they're interested in it, they're, they love it. I think hardly anybody has been up here being like, yeah, I'm gonna collect some multi-beam data, and do some backscatter, you know, like people love what they're doing, they get really interested in it. And I'm sure that's part of your story, you know, maybe you, Maybe you live here, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you've got a background in marine geoscience, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe, you, maybe you're a hydrographer or a survey engineer, maybe you're a geomorphologist, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. You know, maybe you're my mom, right? And uh, next year, maybe I'll try to get my mom here. I think it'd be a great trip for her. And uh, so, but we're all interested in this, right? We're, we, we're, it's all, and that's part of, that's part of your story. Um, but that's not actually the, that's not really, we're not really here to talk about me, despite what you might think. Um, and we're not even here to really talk about you. We're, we're here to talk about the lakes, right? And I think for me, and you know, witness that ship pulling in earlier today, like they're inspiring, right? Like what the lakes inspire all of us. It's not just uh, what's on the surface, whether it's a ship backing into a berth or, or it's craft that's out there, or it's uh, surfers or swimmers or recreators or fishers. It's the lakes themselves are inspiring and that's one of the things that excites us about, about them. so we're kind of here to talk about the great lakes story right and that's that's what it's really all about and it's a story of exploration discovery science data and information right and it's it's a story that actually hasn't been completely told even though we've had 400 years of european colonialism and you know, hundreds, of, if not thousands of years before of indigenous cultures telling stories and having relationships with the lakes in the context of what we're talking about, um, that's, that story hasn't been told. So we're talking about, or I'm talking about the story of bathymetry, right? Of uh, undersea discovery, of geomorphology, terrain, mapping, exploration, modeling, hydrography, right? Or as Siri, who's trying to be helpful, calling it bathtub, 
instead of bathymetry. I don't know if that happens to you, but every time I'm dictating, she always gets it wrong. <laughs> so we have, we're very fortunate though, right? We've had decades of modern technology of being applied to the lakes. And you know, this image is just one example. Uh, we're very fortunate that both our national governments have invested heavily in mapping the Great Lakes, uh, particularly for safety of navigation. Accidents are rare, right? And that's something that we can we can attribute to CHS and Office of Coast Survey and, and the mandates that they follow. Um, other jurisdictional agencies and private groups, academia, have done also great mapping uh, and exploration in the Great Lakes, which is awesome. Uh, we're super fortunate that technology has continued to advance, right? This is an image, I forget the name of the ship, but uh, in conjunction with NOAA and the company Voyas collected this ultra high resolution underwater. I think this is actually an underwater LIDAR image. So technology has continued to advance and many of the technology witness, all of the sponsors and the technology companies that are here um, continue to push the technology forward, driving down the price, increasing uh, access, lowering those barriers to entry. It's not just acquisition either. It's also, as we saw yesterday with Evan's presentation, it's cloud-based tools, and it's not just Teradex there's, or Absolute Ocean. There's lots of these that are emerging and changing the way that people like my mom can interact and explore and understand Great Lakes data. All of this is great to lower barriers. So when we look at the terms of Great Lakes mapping, it's not an entirely, you know, it's not, and when we look at this, the gaps that exist and Christine presented and Noah's done analysis and, and so has Gloss, uh, you know, it's, it's a limited one, but it's not a bleak one because everything is there. We've got the technology, we've got the skills, we've got students coming through programs to help uh, fill uh, those critical roles, but we do have gaps. And so we can, we can safely say that the story has something completely told, despite the fact that it's 2022. And when we look around our, ourselves and our other, the other vectors of our lives, right? We have internet 4.0 is like, it's, we're, it's just on the cusp, right? We're, we're moving into internet 4.0, or some people call it the ambient internet. Industry 4.0 is also upon us, automation of the workplace and manufacturing. And so we've got all of this stuff happening in other vectors of our lives. But when we, you know, as somebody even said the other night, it's like, yeah, but you know, the, the, the way we approach data processing or whatever, it's still the same as it was 10, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And that needs to change. And there's no reason why that type of stuff shouldn't change either. There's no, there's no technical reason now why we can't apply the same things that are happening in other industries to the great ones. And that will help tell our, tell the story. So I'm not trying to be doom and gloom because we are working on it, right? And we look where we are, where we were, I should say, merely four years ago when this concept uh, from, I think it was actually out of a presentation that Hans and others saw, uh, I think it was Heather Stewart, if I'm not mistaken, from Fugro at the time, referred to CBED 2030 and Hans got, Hans got thinking on it. And that quickly morphed into this little collection of uh, groups, and it was really, it was just four years or so ago um, that this whole notion of Fleet Bet 2030 even started. And so it was somewhat aspirational at the time. It was like, hmm, could we? Maybe. And, you know, and then in conjunction with the GLRI funded initiative through GLOSS, there was all of a sudden uh, this, this momentum built up with NMC and Marine Technology Society and Army Corps of Engineers and, and uh, you know, many other icons that are on the slide. Uh, we formed the bottom mapping working group. We had a conference here three years ago in Traverse City, and there was phenomenal, you know, progress since then. Uh, Linda, this is a repeat of Linda's slide, so I'll just go. You know, we the spatial prioritization study that was a uh, you know, large group of organizations involved in that. The gap, various gap analysis, a lot of outreach products that have been developed, and of course the cost of approaches document that we work with a few other companies to produce. Um, but it's more than that. It's also it, 
there's there's lakebed2030.org and i know it's maybe silly to think like oh yeah great you've got a website you know great job tim like but it's important right because people like my mom go to lakebed2030.org and they check it out and they learn about it and maybe they tell their friends and maybe one of their friends is a politician or they work at amazon or they want to get interested or they're a student or they don't have to do it their life so they go to school like you know there's there's lots of reasons why it's important that we do all the little things even making stickers i love stickers People know that about me, but it's important to make stickers, and we make a bunch of stickers and T-shirts, like what Hans and or what Ed is wearing right now. You know, like that type of stuff is all important. So we have been busy the last four years. Um, we had an event in Chicago. We've had this event, even despite COVID, it was a phenomenal success during COVID. And now we have this event today. Three, only three years later, we've got like major stakeholders in the room and major interest and progress to report and a, and a fairly clear plan and direction for where we're going to go so when i when you know we added the slide here here we are like literally here we are this you know, a picture of the dock right up there we're literally here we are and and maybe there's not 500 people in this room and that's okay we have the right people in this room we have admiral evans Shavia Bashard sends her regrets, but we've got the, the right people interested and engaged. And I think that's really the kind of capital that we need, the human capital that we need to advance like that 2030. So what is what is next? Like literally what is next, right? Well, if we, if this was a startup, if Flickbit 2030 was a startup, this, this would be the moment where we've made the product and people started to download it from the app store and we're like freaking out. Right, we're like, this is it. We're gonna go. We're gonna make. We're gonna be a billion-dollar company because people love our product, and you know, everyone's excited. And we, you know, gather around the table. And we're like, well, what do we do? Well, that does happen. Literally, that happens in startups, right? Where you have that aha moment, and you realize that the thing that you've invented, or the idea you've come up with, or the product that you've developed, is desirable by others. And now it's. It's, it's yours, you know, are you gonna be like 92% of the other startups out there that fail, or are you gonna be that 8% and you're gonna be wildly successful? But the only reason those 8% startups become successful is because they do sit down at an imaginary table or a literal table, that's what we need to do, and come up with a real plan, make it happen. That's what needs to happen now, that's where we are. So some of that plan involves strategic planning, like, you know, really thinking through all of all of the some of the topics that we've been talking about it is about building momentum and it's about it's about executing if we were to sort of expand on that a little bit <clears throat> we'd probably try to categorize it into five different areas there's a coalition so who's who's going to be involved and this is not an exclusive community at all i mean i i think it's it's a small community for sure but if you ask people in the ocean mapping world, it's a pretty welcoming community. If there's if there's one thing we all have to talk about, it's about the work that we do because it's exciting. And the other interesting thing about that is not only is it exciting for us to be involved in it, but people are genuinely interested. I'm sure all of you have had conversations with people when you say, oh, I'm, in, I'm involved in the world of underwater mapping or exploration or whatever. They're like, really? How does that work? Is that like like satellites or planes? Like, you know, what, what how does that work? And then you say, oh, no, it's actually done by ships. And they're like, really like things like like on submarines and stuff. And then, you know, people are genuinely interested in what happens. And then you drop the bomb and you say something like, yeah. And did you know that the Great Lakes have never been mapped in, in their entirety in high definition? And then it's like, come on, you know, like, like, like really the Great Lakes? Like I thought maybe the oceans, but the Great Lakes, like aren't there like 50 million people who live around the Great Lakes supporting the $6 trillion economy? And they've never been mapped? And you're like, yeah, for sure, for sure. No, nope, never been mapped. And I'm like, what? Like, so how, you know, so then, so what? How are they gonna get mapped? Like, I don't know, we're working on it. <laughs> I don't know, but that's why we're here. That's part of the plan, that's figuring out how are we gonna get the map? And it is exciting. It's super exciting. Okay, so coalition. So we need to know who's going to do that. Is that it's 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 clearly the federal governments on both sides of the border, and it's the various de departments that support those federal governments. It's not just Canadian Hydrographic Service. It's not just Office of Coast Survey. Right? There's various de departments that need to be involved in this. Um, it's also big tech and small tech. 
right? And I say small tech like the startups because the startups is where the real innovation not, not only happens, but it's certainly we see some pretty wild innovation coming out of startups. So that maker community is really important to get engaged. Where do we find those maker communities? Accelerators, incubators around the region, and they exist in the region. They're all fueling the blue, the blue economy. That's part of tech that we need to tap into. It's the public, uh, it's academia, it's who's providing and growing the human capital that needs to support this industry, places like Northwestern Michigan College and others. It's not just that the school's not, not enough, right? We need to tap into the other schools, Memorial University, CECOM, University of Southern Mississippi, like all those other schools that are that have programs already and schools that don't have programs but should, right? It's not a big stretch. Um, it's also underserved communities and it's other communities that haven't had their voices heard, but they have a voice. And we look around this room and there's like, there's no indigenous communities who are here, yet there's hundreds of indigenous communities who live around the Great Lakes and have a stake in it. So they should be here, they should be part of this conversation. All right, and there's also governance because it's not completely the wild west out there. And so it is important that we have some structure to this program and oversight and looking about making sure that the plan we're executing is, um, uh, is efficient and optimized for the data collection, but also the information access. Outreach is super important as well. And it's maybe like, I didn't joke about my mom, right? <laughs> She's become a meme overnight almost, and she doesn't even have a Twitter account. But um, it's, it is important that we do, we continue to outreach and we get this in the hands of the public so that everyday people, like maybe it's like billboards. I don't, you know, maybe it's the hex map on t-shirts. Maybe we do gamify it and make a million dollar pixel project out of the hex map. I don't know, but I guarantee you that if we get million, there's nearly 50 million people that live in this region, and it really does support a six, six billion dollar, six trillion dollar economy. If we can tap into that, I guarantee we're gonna get more interest, more funding, more expertise, more resources, and ultimately, more bathymetry mapped. Speaking of funding, and I actually made a late change to the slide. I, it was fundraising, but for some reason, fundraising rubs a lot of people the wrong way. They're like, no, my, my, my organization can't do fundraising, you know, we're federal government, whatever. It's like, okay, I hear it. So maybe it's not fundraising, maybe it's not selling hex, hexagon shaped cookies for pretty while. Anyway, maybe it's not selling cookies and t shirts and stickers. Um, Maybe it's, maybe it's, I just had a student suggest earlier today, uh, um, a Kickstarter, Kickstarter, GoFundMe, Go sorry, <laughs> a GoFundMe campaign, I don't know, Terry Lapp, so being over 45, um, a GoFundMe campaign, maybe it's stuff like that, maybe it's sponsoring those hexes, maybe it's seeking congressional appropriation and, and, and funding from the federal government or state governments. Who knows? But I think it's important that we look at different funding models in order to raise the capital because it's not it's not going to be a one and done. I mean, it's a living and breathing ecosystem that needs to be supported and sustained. And so it's going we're going to be mapping the Great Lakes forever. So it's super important that we have a, a, a sustainable, I'll call it a revenue stream, you know, in terms of the startup or business. We need a sustainable revenue stream so we can continue doing the mapping that needs to be done. Technical guidance, it's, there's different perspectives on this, so we're not gonna debate that this morning, but we can all agree that there are multiple tiers of data acquisition, ranging from crowdsource bathymetry on vessels of opportunity, right up to the TJ Jefferson collecting high quality IH or water bathymetry, um, which is phenomenal that we have that range. And just like we're not gonna do high, defin map, high definition mapping of crowdsourced vessels around all of the Great Lakes, it's probably never gonna happen. We're also not gonna have the TJ for the next five years continuously mapping the Great Lakes either. So we need to look at all of those as contributors. And so then we need to look at the technical guidance that needs to go into that. What is the data quality? What is the uncertainty? Um, the, the people who are volunteers collecting data maybe are like this guy, right? They have no idea what uncertainty is. And maybe that's okay, right? Maybe that's fine, as long as we can qualify it and properly attribute it so it goes in the model and so people are aware of it, that's fine. It doesn't mean that it should be excluded. 
my whole point here, I'm not trying to make a pun, my whole point is that there's there's loads of unknowns about what the future means for how we're going to do this. But there are, are also many knowns, and some of those knowns are we have the right expertise, we have the right um, infrastructure sort of set up, we've got a communications vehicle through this conference and others, um, we've got the different groups mostly who need to be involved, um, but what is mostly missing is the plan. And so I was doing a little bit of research and discovered that for what there's a phrase actually for what describes what we're about to do. When what what are we about to do? You know, like something nearly impossible. That's, but we're going to do it anyway, regardless of the conditions, even if it's impractical or difficult. Right? Uh, some of us are going to endure great emotional turmoil. We're not going to whine or complain about it, right? We're going to be proactive in our in our own little local environments to make it happen, and we're going to be industrious and deficient and, and efficient, not deficient, <laughs> industrious and efficient to do the extraordinary. And I think it is extraordinary. And I, I found this in a dictionary, and the term is uh, "get her done," as Tobator says from Cars, right? Um, and a friend of mine even. The other night who lives in northern michigan said this exact term i don't know if that's surprising but at the end of the day and i go bring it back to the story we all want to be part of the story is why we're here right like it's kind of cool it's one of the reasons why i live in victoria and i'm proud to be working in the great lakes because it's cool it's fun it's exciting i want to be part of being able to tell my kids and my grandkids that yeah i was involved in mapping the great lakes for the first time like first time in high definition that's pretty neat and i think that's one of the reasons why why we're here that's that's part of the story that we want to tell and i don't it's not my story it's not it's not your story it's our story right and at the end of the day the great lake today the great lakes are they remain unexplored and we want to change that we want to help tell their story the great lake story and i think that's what we ultimately want to shoot for with this plan. So Hans is going to, that's it for me, Hans is going to share some details on the next steps of events and um, I think I think you'll all hear from us, I'll say us, whoever us is, that's NOAA, NMC and, and GLOSS and others who are uh, active stakeholders in this project and then there will be opportunities to get involved and engaged to help tell the story. So that's, if you've got any questions for me, I'm happy to take Maybe you just one comment about your co-funding kind of model. Do you think that's the way to go in terms of matching funds? You know, in Canada there is this infrastructure fund where you have one third coming from municipality, one third from the province, and one third for federal. So something like that, states, municipality, cities with federal, you know, uh, and I'm not saying that I have a magic formula, but I think it's palatable for government to see money coming in and match it instead of providing all the funding. Uh, it's a great observation, and I, I should have uh, I, sh I should have mentioned that actually as one of the opportunities for a mechanism of how we convert the funding wherever it comes from into execution. And I think the the Rick T. Brennan matching fund that NOAA has that phenomenal program. I hope it continues because. If we can get momentum around this type of thing to funnel some funds towards NOAA so they can properly allocate that for survey days for vessels or contract vendors or whoever it is, it's a great, great idea, a great program, and I think it could be replicated elsewhere as well. Any other questions? And the deadline was just extended to October 16th. If you still want to apply. <laughs> Okay, all right, well, thanks very much. And uh, Hans, I'll turn it over to you for next steps.